mother in her last public duty asked Liz Truss to do the same. The opening event of Rishi Sunak's premiership was stripped bare. No family, no applauding aides or MPs in Downing Street. A bleakness to match the tough times and the embarrassing political chaos that had brought him to this place. It is only right to explain why I'm standing here as your new Prime Minister. Right now, our country is facing a profound economic crisis. The aftermath of Covid still lingers. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilised energy markets and supply chains the world over. I want to pay tribute to my predecessor, Liz Truss. She was not wrong to want to improve growth in this country. It is a noble aim. But some mistakes were made. Not born of ill will or bad intentions. Quite the opposite, in fact. But mistakes nonetheless. And I have been elected as leader of my party and your Prime Minister, in part, to fix them. And that work begins immediately. I will place economic stability and confidence at the heart of this government's agenda. This will mean difficult decisions to come. He was rolling the pitch for spending cuts and tax rises. The borrowing spree that Liz Truss went on is over. The government I lead will not leave the next generation, your children and grandchildren, with a debt to settle that we were too weak to pay ourselves. This government will have integrity, professionalism and accountability at every level. Trust is earned and I will earn yours. I will always be grateful to Boris Johnson for his incredible achievements as Prime Minister and I treasure his warmth and generosity of spirit. And I know he would agree that the mandate my party earned in 2019 is not the sole property of any one individual. It is a mandate that belongs to and unites all of us. As he well knows, Boris Johnson's short-lived bid to get the Premiership back was based on him being the only man with the right to rule, as voters backed his manifesto in 2019. Rishi Sunak said he understood the tough times people were going through and their disappointment with recent political leadership. I fully appreciate how hard things are. And I understand too that I have work to do to restore trust after all that has happened. All I can say is that I am not daunted. I know the high office I have accepted and I hope to live up to its demands. Rishi Sunak then tried his very best to ram home the sombre message with an unsmiling photo opportunity. The photographers had other ideas and nearly cracked his resolve. His first task, putting together what AIDS said, would be a cabinet based not on factional loyalty but talent. In which case, Rishi Sunak didn't think much of the cabinet Liz Truss pulled together. So far, 11 of her ministers have not made it into Rishi Sunak's cabinet. Straight after leaving his job, Jacob Rees-Mogg was debating with his own side from the back benches and not in the new spirit of unity. Does he understand the severe doubts that many people have about the practicality of what is on offer? I'm afraid my honourable friend has never liked the decision to leave the European Union and everything he says must be taken in that, in that context because otherwise, otherwise he would not have intervened. Rishi Sunak's agenda 
has plenty of potential flashpoints that could challenge the talk of unity. And Tory MPs who always hoped he'd never go through this door. An awful lot of people blamed him for Boris Johnson's downfall, hated him for t raising taxes. There were Rishi Sunak haters all over this building and in the wider party. Are you sure he can live that down? I was David Cameron's parliamentary private secretary for eight years. I, all, I know all about haters. Uh, it's part of the human condition. They're all still out there. They lurk. <laughs> they lurk. He'll, they just lurk. Have, he'll just have to swap them or... He, absolutely. Out, out that's that's what po uh, politics is about, outwitting and swatting. Rishi Sunak brought back some figures of the Boris Johnson and David Cameron years. Brought back Suella Braverman, sacked for a leak that breached the ministerial code last week. And he gave Penny Mordaunt back her old job, below what she thought she was due reflected in a grumpy face as she left the building. Early this morning, a removal van was spotted at the back of Downing Street. In her brief premiership, Liz Truss never got round to unpacking some of the boxes she arrived with. She left number 10 with most of her main measures reversed, but her convictions intact. From my time as Prime Minister, I am more convinced than ever that we need to be bold and confront the challenges that we face. As the Roman philosopher Seneca wrote, it's not because things are difficult that we do not dare. It's because we do not dare that they are difficult. We simply cannot afford to be a low growth country where the government takes up an increasing share of our national wealth. It means lower taxes so people can keep more of the money that they earn. And it means delivering growth She's got quite fixed ideological views. It was always very difficult to move her to a sort of compromised position in, uh, in my experience on things like trade agreements and so on. She had a very ideological fixed uh, view and that remains uh, the case. It looks like even the shortest premiership we can remember hasn't moved her. She's still right. Well, she has, as I said, quite, uh, quite strong ideological views. Liz Truss's experiment with a cabinet of only loyal supporters now being dismantled, like her economic experiment by the man who warned throughout the leadership contest he lost that it would all end in disaster. Friends say even Rishi Sunak surprised it all fell apart so fast. Gary Given reporting there, and he'll join us again at the end of the programme. Now, the Conservative Member of Parliament, Kevin Hollerake, is in Westminster for us now. Thank you very much for coming on the programme. It was a very powerful speech that uh, the new Prime Minister gave here this morning, and there was a line in it that really struck me. He said, I stand here before you to put your needs above politics. But I wonder whether appointing Suella Braverman back to her old job that she was sacked from six days ago for security breaches is putting politics, factional politics, above integrity. Well, I think obviously he feels Suella is the best person for the job and he obviously feel, also feels Ben Wallace was the best person for the job in defence, James Cleverley, Foreign Secretary, Grant Shapps, Business Secretary and Michael Gove back to levelling up. So it's a real, uh, he's drawn from all four corners of the party trying to form a mm. cabinet that's um, a cabinet of all the talents uh, and a cabinet of unity, which I think the country wants to see mm. right now. But it also strikes me as that it might be a talent of all the factions because there are some people here who've come back who perhaps promised uh, the man that you supported all along, Rishi Sunak, something that he now has to pay back. Well, I, I, to my knowledge, Rishi ne never made any promises to anybody, no backroom deals. He, I think he's gone about forming his cabinet in a way that reflects the entire views of the party, different viewpoints in, in different factions, as you call them. But uh, basically, uh, Conservatives believe in the same thing, which is freedom, which is low taxes, small state, getting the economy growing. Rishi believes in all those things. But to get to that point, we need a cabinet of all the talents. And I think that's what he's set about putting together. And yet we know that your party is also bitterly divided. That's why we keep changing Prime Minister in the building behind me. So it takes an awful lot to get those factions, uh, factions to act in a unified way. I wonder if that is now the main priority of this government, apart from appeasing the markets. Stop it from, you know, stop the knives, the daggers from being plunged into people's backs. Well, the priority is going to be stability and meeting the needs of households and businesses who are going to suffer, are suffering already and will suffer more over, over the coming months. That's what we're going to set about addressing rather than 
petty fan, uh, political differences in here, but mm -hmm. I don't accept that our party is divided. Yes, we've had some divisions, but Rishi's going to set about bringing the party together. But there's much we agree on, as well as there are some differences in certain areas. Fundamentally, Conservatives believe in the mm. same thing, whether you're a member of the, the One Nation group, um, social justice, or you're the member of the ERG, you still believe in low taxes, you still believe in small state, you still believe giving people opportunity, and those are the things that will always unite us. I'm sorry, the party does come across as being very divided. I mean, we had Nadine Doris, the former culture secretary, on the front page of the Times this morning uh, with a picture of the... Uh, you know, of, of all the, the Tory men greeting Rishi Sunak yesterday at party headquarters saying, where are all the women? Spot the women. There aren't any. I mean, this is, you know, this is not exactly being complimentary about the new team. Well, I think it's fair to say about, and you will understand this, that Dean Doris doesn't speak for the entire political par parliamentary party. Most of us absolutely support Rishi Sunak. He had a huge number of people supporting him in terms of members of parliament. The other candidates couldn't really get to the 100. That's what it appears to be. So, uh, you know, he had at least twice as many as any other candidate. That's a good place to be. Mm. What we need to do now, as Rishi said today outside Downing, number 10 Downing Street, was it's got to be actions rather than words people will judge us on. We've got 18 months, two years to get this right. We've got a, our laser focus of every mm. single member of parliament, every single minister has got to be on addressing the problems the country faces. And yet it doesn't seem as if the sniping from the sidelines, from the back benches, uh, has stopped them. Jacob Rees-Mogg um, demoted today. There he was again in the House of Commons sniping at the new government. That's not really helpful, is it, for you? Well, I mean, there'll, there'll always be some lone voices, but predominantly, and I would urge all, uh, every single member of Parliament to support the Prime Minister. And I think people did try to support Liz Truss. I think events overtook Liz Truss. Generally, we want our Prime Minister to succeed, our leaders to succeed, because that's good for our party, but more importantly, it's good for the country. So I'd urge every single member of Parliament to give the Prime Minister their full support. I said earlier that uh, Rishi Sunak feels a bit like a broom who's come in to sweep away the mess of the previous administration. And then he talked about hope, of course, but where's the hope in all this? It looks like a very bleak picture that you're preparing us for. Well, we've got a difficult time right now, but if, we, if, we, if our policies are right, and you've already seen uh, bond yields, for example, come back, back to a place that before the place they were before the mini budget, so the markets are reassured, which is good because they have a direct relationship with interest rates. So people shouldn't feel any adverse impacts from that. Inflation will be temporary. Inflation is probably about peak uh, right now. Interest rates will go up, but they'll peak hopefully middle of next year. Hopefully the economy will be growing again next year and interest rates will start to come down again. Mm. So okay. there, are, there is some positive news ahead as well as some of the difficulties right. we've got in the short okay. term. Got to leave it there. Kevin Hollenrake, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Well, let's talk through some of the implications of the Cabinet changes today with our policy correspondent, Paul McNamara. Paul, Suella Braverman, first of all. Yeah, so that's the first big name. Gary was already talking about her a little bit earlier on. The first big thing to note is that what this really means is that Rwanda and the deporting people to Rwanda, mm. that is still back on the table. It was never formally off the table. Rishi Sunak did speak about it during the summer mm. when he last ran for the mm. leadership race. But then it all went a bit quiet and Liz Truss was parking it. I understand from sources within the ERG that when they met with Rishi Sunak, they got no actual assurances on what his stance would be on Rwanda. They were a little bit nervous. Now with Suella, Suella Bradman back in the Home Office, mm. that policy is back on the table. He's appeased the right of the party. There's also, as Gary was talking about earlier on, this, this argument about migration numbers. Suella Bradman, yeah. we understand, wants to limit the numbers. Jeremy Hunt wants to keep it open to boost the economy. Whoever wins that argument is going to have a big impact on the finances that the man in number 11 has to sort out. Indeed, and hands are tied all around because of the lack of money. Now, what about Michael Gove? He's back up as levelling up secretary, a job that he had a few months ago, and levelling up has you know, made a comeback as a fashionable term. Absolutely. I mean, when we were here earlier on, Rishi Sunak came out and gave his big speech. The 29 Manifesto, he made yeah. a big point about making that. You think about that manifesto, you think Brexit, and you think about levelling up. Well, the county uh, council's network has already made a big point today that inflation costs are rising. Local authorities need a lot more money. Levelling up costs big, mm. and it's the one thing that Rishi Sunak was also saying, money is one thing we haven't got. And the other thing that costs big is a commitment to 3% of your GDP on defence, which, of course, is not his commitment. 
Will he stick to it? What's been Ben Wallace, who stays in his job as Defence Secretary, been saying about it? Well, again, he hasn't made a firm commitment to stick to that 3%, but Ben Wallace is remaining in Whitehall as the... And that 3%, uh, by the way, Secretary. is worth £18 billion a year. It's a huge amount of money, isn't it? Yeah. It's absolutely huge. I mean, the Defence budget last year was about £42 billion, uh, and that was at, at 2%. Mm. So this is a massive uplift at a time where we haven't got it. But there is a feeling there that... Rishi Sunak has to keep Ben Wallace quite happy. Mm. A, because Ben Wallace is one of the very few popular Tory MPs. Mm. He's like not just within the party, but across the country. Also, he's no Rishi Sunak loyalist. Mm. Ben Wallace was, I, I understand, Ben Wallace was on the call when Boris Johnson spoke to all of his yeah. acolytes saying that he wasn't going to stand. And, and I understand from sources on that call mm. that Ben Wallace was saying to him, look, you've got to stand. Rishi Sunak isn't guaranteed to commit to that 3%. So, although Kevin Hollenreg denied it, this is a, a very delicate juggle of all the different factions, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you go through just those three people there, we've got billions of pounds of commitments at a time when a couple of hours ago mm. Rishi Sunak said belts are going to be tightened. I don't know how they work out the maths and keep everyone happy. We're going to find out soon enough. Paul, thanks very much indeed. Well, earlier I spoke to the Conservative peer Lord Lamont, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer in John Major's government. Is Rishi Sunak the medicine this country now needs? Well, I'm not sure about the word medicine, but I think we've got to face up to reality. And the reality is we've got a very serious economic situation. And I think we haven't faced up to the fact we've been running a big deficit, deficit in trade, a deficit above all in public spending and borrowing. And a certain amount of fiscal discipline is necessary. And I think Rishi Sunak is extremely well qualified. I think he's exactly the right person for this moment, for this crisis. I thought his remarks outside number 10 today were absolutely excellent. I would say they were the best remarks by any incoming Prime Minister outside number 10 since Mrs Thatcher. Praise thought, indeed, seriously. You know, I really thought they were very good, mm -hmm. they were very direct, very serious, no smiling, no artificiality, mm. gaiety. About it was the exact opposite to boosterism. Yes, exactly. Which is what is needed right now. He said that he would work every day uh, to fill every day with hope. Where's the hope in all this? Well, the hope may be a little bit distant at the moment, uh, but things can improve. I think the main obstacle for the government is not really the Labour Party. I think the government could recover quite a long way in the polls, but the great difficulty for the government is the international environment. Mm. I can see the world slowing down. We don't know what's going to happen in Ukraine, but the world economy looks as though it may slow down, and that means that there won't be a lot of good news for some time to come, but we've got to put our own house in order. And I think we also need to rebuild our reputation a bit. I don't think the mini-budget did us any good abroad and all the antics have caused people to be rather puzzled. All the politicking has caused people to be rather puzzled as to whether Britain, which has a tradition of stability and good governance, has gone astray. To be honest, we've become a laughingstock abroad, haven't we? Well, I've certainly heard people expressing puzzlement and bewilderment about what's going on, but I've been a bit bewildered by myself. You and others have been very critical about this so-called mini-budget of a few weeks ago, of, of not being thought through, really, in terms of the consequences. I wonder if that trend of not thinking about the consequences of certain actions in government started six years ago, and we're, we're, you know, we're dealing with this cycle of an emotional reaction to something, if you like, an ideological you know, knee-jerk reaction, and then we have to clean up the mess afterwards. No, I don't... I don't think that's fair on the Johnson administration, frankly. You know, it had a difficult uh, task with Brexit and with various other issues. I don't think it... But I think what went wrong with the mini-budget was pretty clear and pretty obvious that you couldn't have this gigantic price guarantee scheme plus unfunded tax cuts all at the same time, all without an OBR assessment, which mm. really spooked the markets. So whatever this administration now does, the truth is that we're in for some lean times, aren't we? I think we are in for a difficult period ahead, and Rishi Sunak made that crystal clear on the steps of Downing Street. How many years, do you think? Well, I don't know whether it'll be 
years and years, I really don't know. I mean, it may be 18 months, it might be less than two years. Let's hope so. We could see things, you know, maybe there'll be an end to the war in Ukraine. Doesn't look likely at the moment, but that would make a world of difference if it were. Guy Hans, the, the prominent Tory donor, investor, said a few days ago, resurrecting a phrase from the 1970s, that we are on track to become the sick man of Europe again. Well, I right? don't. I don't believe that. I think the problems we have uh, can be overcome. I don't think our present plight is irreversible, and I think in Rishi Sunak, you've got exactly the right man for this moment. You think he'll last? I'm absolutely certain he'll last. Do you think your party can unite behind him? Well, um, this is a, this is a government of all the factions, not necessarily all the talents. Well, when, when, when you say, can the party unite, that is the right way to put the question. It's not just the responsibility of Rishi Sunak to unite the party, it is the responsibility of the party to unite itself. Mm. And I think a lot of people have got a lot of hard thinking to do, and I hope they're doing it. Lord Lamont, thank you very much.